Okay, thank you, Marnik. Uh, let me see if I can already share my screen. It seems so. So, uh, you should all be able to then uh, log in. This is the the website. Uh, I don't know, Marnik, if you want to put the link on the chat. Uh, meanwhile, just in case somebody is not uh, in here yet, uh, you yes, just need to sign in. And then if you already have created the account uh, yesterday, this will take only a few seconds, or if not, uh, it may take a couple of minutes. But while we wait for that, uh, you can also maybe uh, paste the the address, the link for the tutorial material. And um, so you can see everything is here. So in order uh, not to repeat much, what, what you will already be reading from the instructions and what Marnik uh, has said. I just want to maybe make a few clarifications on the key points uh, that you're going to find in this tutorial. So as, as, as Marnik uh, already gave you an overview of what you will be doing here, uh, the first thing that you're going to start with is uh, well, with the, with the objective of then eventually running a quantum espresso calculation, you have already been running quantum espresso calculations the whole week, the, this whole two weeks now. So now you're going to learn how to do this through AIDA so that everything will be automatically tracked. And, uh, and in order to do so, you first need to populate the database with the information you want to use. Uh, and so, you, the, the first thing would be interacting with this database. Here is uh, this uh, funny drawing just to illustrate a bit what I'm talking about. Uh, the first step is then how to interact with the database because you won't be directly seeing the database. Uh, you will be interacting in a, in a user interface that will be how you've been working this whole, this whole two weeks, like with the terminal. And uh, so you will have to you have to learn to create to send information to the database to create uh, data nodes that you will want to use in your calculations, and then also not just create the nodes but uh, use them. And to use them, you need to reference them somehow. And uh, in order to do this, uh, you will be using a, a property of each of the nodes. Each node that you create on the database, each node that exists on the database can be identified but by one of two possible identifiers. One of these identifiers is the unique uh, identifier UUID. And the other one of these identifiers is the PK or ID, uh, solely ID. Uh, PK or ID are interchangeable for us. And uh, what is the difference between these two identifiers? Uh, it is explained in the tutorial, and I may actually quiz you on that uh, afterwards. So pay attention to that. But in principle, these are the two things. So if you want to say, oh, I created this node, when you create a node, AIDA will tell you, okay, this is the identifier for that node. So then if you want to do something with this node, uh, even like show me the information of this node, all you need to do is use this identifier. So bird the node show and this number. So you will be learning how to use this throughout the tutorial. Pay attention to which is the identifier of each node. And if you want to reference a node to see which is the proper identifier of that node you want to reference. Uh, so that is uh, one thing to pay attention to. Then, uh, as Marnik said, you will uh, run this uh, calculation. And then once you know how to do this, you know how to do what, uh, to run a single step, a single calculation, we will illustrate how you can leverage the power of AIDA to, to then automatically run full workflows. And we will do this by just providing you with one of these workflows. And uh, so you can see how easy it is to set everything that you need and to run it and automatically get the result of a complex process, what will otherwise be a complex process and series of different steps that will perform automatically. Uh, of course, you can check. Uh, there are ways you can check what's happening uh, 
behind the curtains, you can see what, what this workflow does, but we will not get into the details of, of how to make this by yourself. You will probably get some ideas because uh, you will see that uh, we will be doing a lot of Python scripting. So if you catch easily into that, uh, you can start getting some ideas of how to concatenate different, uh, different calculations into one of these workflows. But uh, the, of course, to have the full advantage of the, of the specific tools we have for this, uh, you need more specific knowledge. For this, you have, uh, well, you can check the AIDA documentation. Uh, also, Marnik, maybe link in the chat if you may, uh, which has a lot of information on AIDA, uh, which also includes like a getting started guide with instructions of how to install it in your own workstation. This was one of the questions that we had uh, previously about like the space or the how much it would cost to have a, and no, this is a completely free. You can install it in your workstation and work from there and everything is stored locally. And we also have tutorials and different how-to guides, uh, which include making these workflows, but also if you want a more personalized, uh, dedicated thing for this. We will also have soon in July uh, a tutorial uh, dedicated to AIDA, one week tutorial, which uh, you can see we will talk maybe more about this uh, later or you can ask us if you're interested. But you have all the information again in the AIDA net website. So the last thing I wanted to tell you about this is that uh, you will be doing all of this that uh, I already described, start interacting with the, with the database, creating nodes, referencing nodes, running the calculation, running the workflow. And then uh, we're going to use a tool in the materials cloud uh, that allows you to, gives you another way of, of exploring your database. We will finally, in the end, see another final way of exploring database uh, with Flaviano. But uh, before that, we will be doing some exploring using the materials cloud here. And uh, it requires you to do, uh, to start the REST API uh, service in AIDA. So the way you do this, I want to show it to you now. I will show it to you again uh, before the break that it will be closer to when most of you will be doing this part. But for those of you who are quick, I want to just show you what you have to do. So you have to open, we'll open one terminal. And uh, after you have worked and familiarized yourself with AIDA, uh, you need to, and you want to explore it through the materials cloud, you need to somehow connect these two things, connect what the, this service here where you have been working and uh, the material side, uh, the material, uh, materials cloud website so this is done through two steps first steps is just start the rest api and it's as simple as running verdi rest api which is uh, the command here you just start this and then starts running in your terminal you won't be able to keep using this terminal but uh, this already will be exposing your database but since we are inside this uh, Jupyter Hub virtual machine, we have to do a second step of exposing the database, which is the ngrok uh, setting, which is here. Again, uh, this is just so you have like a visual idea of what you will have to do, but the instructions are all already on the, on the tutorial page. Just want to show you what it looks like and so that it blocks the terminal so this doesn't surprise you. Again, I will run the ngrok command. Again, it blocks the terminal, but it's exposing uh, my, my database. Now, externally, this is ready. And finally, you will have to go to the materials cloud website. This link will show you directly into the explore section. And here you have uh, the Connect Your REST API. Uh, typically, it, uh, if you were working directly in your computer, you would use uh, an address like the one that appears here. But since we're having to go through NGROC, 
uh, what you have to do is copy this address that is here where it says forwarding and it says uh, this uh, localhost 500 the address that is previous to that one you need to copy this one And then, and this is uh, at the end, you have to add API v4, I think. And then you will be able to connect to your database and explore it through this interface. So again, just to show you what the process is like, because uh, there are not many images of this in the in the in the instructions so that you have a visual idea of, uh, of how to do this and how to uh, what needs to be copied where again i will uh, try to do this uh, again after, uh, before the break uh, so that you uh, you get these instructions again closer to where you need so i think that's it for me uh, i will leave you well if somebody has any questions, we can uh, look at them now. You can ask them now, or else I will. You can start with the tutorial and start uh, learning through practice. Yeah, just for people who are a bit confused, um, Francisco is already just explaining how to connect to the REST API because this process is a bit more complicated on these Jupyter Hub clusters. But you should just start at the beginning of the quantum espresso section of the material. So just start there um, and executing the, the commands that are shown there. And then this, maybe we can still repeat this later on if people are having issues with connecting to the REST API. Yes. Again, I, I just maybe uh, to have like a spatial idea, I just show you the first, very first part of the tutorial that what you will need to know about PKs and UUIDs and pay attention to this. And the very last part of the quantum espresso section where you will see. Uh, you will need to, to do this connection that can be tricky. So, uh, but the instructions are there. This is just to, for you to get a, an image of what it looks like. The, you will be able to follow it through the instructions now more easily. You can import this structure. You can um, uh, and then look at, at import, how to import the structure into your database and just follow the commands that are executed here. And let us know if you have any questions, right? Next, you'll move on to running a calculation where first you will set up the code that you want to run, which is just PW code from Quantum Espresso. And so simply follow these commands. Some people also were wondering how to copy these um, commands into their terminal. Um, here you can use this nice little copy button feature. So you simply click on that, it says copied, and then you can go to the terminal and then, well, I think you can also just do paste by clicking right click and clicking on paste, but typically you will have a shortcut for this, um, depending on the operating system you have. For example, in my case, it's max, I do command V, 
In case you're running Windows, it's usually Control V. Um, and so then you can just redo that, and then you can execute the command. At this point, I don't have any codes in my database. Of course, this is still empty. But if you set the code, it will show you the code that you have set up. OK? Marek, maybe you want to show them again where to find the link to the uh, to the cloud computer system that they can run this. If maybe somebody lost in the Slack the information. Uh, I put I put the link again in the Slack um, recently, so it should still be there. I can copy it again if you like. It's, it's just in the final part of the Slack, so you can find the link to the to the Jupyter Hub cluster and also the link to the material. That should be fine. Yeah. So I think it should be okay. If anyone has any problems, again, just you know, I either raise your hand here so we can help you out or. Um, let us know on the Slack or Zoom chat. So I see a question from Amal on how to specify the PK. Um, well, you simply, if you want to, for example, do um, um, a pro or a show go, for example, in the node you just imported, you can just specify it as the number of the PK. Uh, if your database is entirely clean, this PK will just be one. So you can specify it as a number for the command line interface for Birdie. Uh, there are other questions in the in the chat here on Zoom. When doing output, where are the files saved? Which folder? Uh, so, if you've already run the calculation, and um, Aida will have taken the output files that it retrieves from the calculation, and it will put them in the repository. So, there's two places where information is stored in Aida. You have the database and the repository. The database is usually for smaller information, such as specific outputs, Fermi energy, and so, and so forth. And then the repository is for larger outputs, either larger matrices, which are stored as NumPy, binary files, or, um, for example, the output files are also stored in the repository. Node repository is also, well, in this case, it's online because, of course, you're running on this Jupyter Hub cluster. Um, but if you would have installed it on your workstation, when setting up your profile, you will specify where this repository is. So you can do this, for example, on, on an extra, uh, a hard drive that, that's attached to your workstation. And so you can store these typically larger files in the repository. Something like Git. Um, it's, no, I don't think it, it, you can compare it to Git. It's, it's basically just a, a file repository. So basically a collection of files on your workstation. And if you do output LS, you will simply see for a specific calculation which files are stored as output files in the repository on your workstation, right? And then you can see with the output cat, you can then, for example, get the outputs. And if you want to store it in a different file, you can, of course, write redirect this in Linux to the specific file um, using typical Linux syntax um, or bash syntax. I also see a question on IDA pseudo. So if you do IDA pseudo install SSP um, and then slash uh, H so to get the help, you will see how to also specify different protocols for, for these pseudo potentials. So I think the command for the, um, for, for the protocol is hyphen P. There's also a hyphen V or the option for, for, for the, the version and such so forth. So you can install all of these pseudo potential families for the SSP quite easily using uh, either pseudo install commands. We also have support for, um, for pseudo dojo pseudo potentials. So those are also, also supported with automated installer commands. If you want to install your own pseudo potential family, you can also do so. But um, for this, you have to co co consult IDA pseudo documentation. Um, this is a bit more involved.
So to answer Christian's question, um, for the PK, you actually have to fill in the PK of the node in your database. For example, for the structure, um, after you've imported it, it will tell you what the PK is of, of the structure node that is in your database. And so you have to fill in this number actually when doing the verdi node show command. Uh, same result is shown on screen. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, this was also answering that. I'm not sure what Bindia means with this or her question. To answer Amal's question, um, you have to put in the PK, the primary key of your code. So if you set up your code, you can now do Verdi code lists and see which is the PK of the node you have set up. So then you find that PK, you plug it into load code, and then it should be working for you. Yes, exactly, Amal. If, if, your PK of your code is two, then you simply plug in code two uh, for this code PK. So to answer Alberto's question, um, if you've already started the daemon previously, which you should have done when running the calculation, the daemon will still be running. So the daemon, you can always check the, the status of the daemon by doing burden, dirty daemon status, as I write in the chat now. So you can always execute a command to see if your daemon is running. If it's not running, you can always restart it with dirty daemon start. And if for whatever reason you want to stop it, you can do so with dirty daemon stop. So to answer Amal's question, you won't get any output because you load the code and then plug it into the code uh, Python variable. So it's normal that you don't get any output there, but it will still be stored, of course, this code inside the code variable. Uh, for Ignatius' question, well, the Verdi command is, is in, in, in the bash terminal. So if you're running, um, so if you're running Verdi shell, you're inside the IPython uh, terminal. So there you cannot be running any Verdi commands. This is only when you're running bash. You can clearly see the difference between commands that have to be executed uh, just in bash uh, with, with this dollar sign and also the, the, the code snippet will have a blue background. And then the commands you have to execute in the Verdi shell will have this in and out um, uh, for the prompts of the IPython uh, shell. And then you'll also see that the background of these code snippets will be more yellowish. Actually, uh, Francisco just made a very good point uh, in the chat. So you can also, if you're inside your Verdi shell, execute um, bash commands by simply adding an exclamation point. So in your case, let me, yeah, exactly. So okay. copy this. So you can do this inside the Verdi shell as well in order to then quickly see again well, what the PK of your structure is in case you've forgotten it. 
Alternatively, of course, you can open a second terminal as well. And in one, you can use a Verdi shell, and in the other, you can then execute bash commands, uh, whatever workflow works best for you. Thanks, Tim. That's nice to hear. So for a structure PK, you can execute this command, Verdi data structure list. Um, oh, crap. I now notice that I apparently only sent this to Francisco because he had sent me a message. But this is the command that you can do inside the Verdi shell to figure out again what the PK is of that structure in your database. Syntax error. I'll have to see. Ivan, we do have breakout rooms available in case you want to help people one on one, right? Sure, sure. It's, uh, I don't know, wait, you should maybe, okay, let me check. Uh, Massimo. Uh, uh, Massimo. Uh, yes, we. Usually, oh, yes, the. Uh, do we have breakout rooms? I, I don't see them. Oh, sorry. There was someone close them. Be careful, please, because uh, all of you have the right to close them. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, someone, someone has closed the, the way up. OK. OK, now I can see okay, them. Do so you see them? <laughs> I see that that Amelia's problem has already been solved. That's great. <laughs> okay. So the breakout room is no longer necessary, but thank you, Massimo. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll uh, probably need them later again. So, um, so to answer Amal's question, so the PKs, again, these are primary keys, which are identifiers in your database. So as I also mentioned in the tutorial material, um, it will depend on, 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 on what's already in your database when, when you are setting up the structure. So to figure out the PK that you need to put there, you have to run this command, Verdi data structure list. I'll post it again. You can do this in the Verdi shell, so if in the IPython kernel. And there, you will then get a, a list of, of the structures, which should be only one, the silicon structure you just imported. And it will, sh will show you the PK of your structure in the database. And then you can plug that in the structure PK.
uh, to Florina. Uh, no, uh, remember that. Uh, so the using the exclamation mark before the Verdi works when you are inside the the Verdi shell. But if you're on in, oh, so the Python shell, but if you are in the Bash shell, which I think you are, you just uh, you don't use the the exclamation mark. So Daniel, um, to get the code PK, you normally should have already set up your codes um, with the Verdi code setup command. And if you've done so, you can then again execute Verdi code list to figure out the PK of your code in the database. Um, if you're doing this again in the bash, you can just do Verdi command, uh, Verdi code list. If you are doing this inside the Verdi shell, you first have to add this exclamation point. Um, Um, okay, well, maybe Francisco, uh, you can move into the tutor to your tutor room and help um, Alberto. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be there. The to answer Joseph's question, um, so the builder indicates that if you try to run, um, the builder in through the IDA engine, it doesn't have the required value for structure. So at some point earlier, you provide the structure to the builder. And so it seems that this step has not been executed. So to answer Emil's question, um, the data factory, I mean, when you're doing the, the initial calculation, you actually specify the k-point mesh, if I'm not mistaken. So there, um, it will not automatically determine what the appropriate k-point mesh, mesh is. When it comes to the, the workflow that's ready to run with the protocol, uh, there, well, we've done a, a series of tests with different k-point densities. And so we found that for a certain k-point density, you have a reasonable position for a law structure. So if you're using this default protocol, 
it will simply determine the k point mesh based on that k point density value, which basically is specified by, by a distance of 0 0.15 inverse angstroms uh, between the k points in, in, in reciprocal space. So to answer Florida's question, um, when you're doing Verdi node show, you have to plug in the PK number of one of these structures. So you, I see you've already imported silicon twice. So now you have two nodes in your database, the PK one and two that represent straight silicon structure. So you can then just do uh, Verdi node show one or Verdi node show two, and then you will get more information on that structure data node from your database. So maybe for a last question, well, so you have to make sure that the structure, the structure that you're providing, of course, is actually the structure data. So if you've loaded the node into the structure, you need to make sure that this PK actually corresponds to the PK of the structure data. So if you, if you for example, just now in the Verdi shell do structure, does it show you that this actually corresponds to a structure data or not? So to answer Amal, um, it basically, you have to, to, to figure out what, what the process 
ID is or the process PK is, you first should run um, 30, wait, 30. And then you can see the list of processes and you should get the right PK. So I'm assuming that the, the node in your database with, with PK2 doesn't correspond to the actual process node. This will most likely be either the, the structure or the code. So we are running close um, to the break, the coffee break. I just would like to say one thing before you can all have a rest and then continue with the tutorial uh, afterwards. For the second part of the tutorial, um, I'll put the link in the Zoom chat. We have to import uh, a database from uh, an online repository. Uh, and so if you follow this link here, let me quickly share my screen. You will wind up on the second part or so the second section of the tutorial hands-on. And so here's a command that actually imports this database. Now we've noticed that on this Jupyter um, hub cluster, it can take quite a bit of time for this import command to complete. So maybe while we have our coffee break, it would be good if you can basically copy this command, then go to your terminal, paste it there, and then start importing this database already. So once you're completed with the first part of the tutorial, you immediately already have this data available in your database. So now it's technically time for the coffee break. Um, of course, if you want to keep on working on the material, feel free to go, go ahead. Um, I'll just be here to answer questions still or, or move into a Zoom room with us. Any other problems? Now we're seeing our question from Gosley. So again, probably the, the node you have loaded into the structure variable in Python doesn't correspond to a structure data node. Um, so you should check again if you just do in a set of for yourself structure. Does it um, show you that this actual node that you have loaded is a structured data native node or not? Maybe I can also move into a, a breakout room with you to help you out. And Amal, um, to open the PDF file, let me maybe quickly share my screen again. So you can go to the file manager, right? So if you just click on this in the main tab of the, the Jupyter Hub terminal, you can just click on the file manager and then you can navigate to the file that you want to open. Typically, you can just click on, 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 on the file and it will open in a different tab of, um, of the browser. But if there is an issue, you can always also just click on the file and then click download and then open it on your, on your machine. And uh, yeah, to answer Fernanda's question, yes, you can open as many terminals uh, as you'd like. This may need be handy if you're doing, for example, one terminal for the bash shell and one terminal for, for the birdie shell.
monitoring the, the Slack channel quite closely today and tomorrow. Um, so we'll be happy to answer any questions you have there. Ah, yes. So if you for, for to answer Amal's question, so the, the, the PK you have to load here is the PK of the output parameters dictionary, right? Because this actually contains the energy of your system. So to see what the um, output parameters dictionary uh, node PK is, you can do verdi process show. I think if you've been just following the tutorial, the PK should be 90. If not, you have to foresee with verdi process list uh, which are the PKs that are available. And then if you don't do verdi process show, it will show you in the output nodes which one is the actual output parameters node. And so you need to plug in that PK in the load node command that you showed. Uh, maybe I can quickly go in the breakout room with you, Amal. I think yeah, they should still be open. Um, okay. okay, there's there's no tutor room with my name for, on it, but we can just move into the the tutor room, and then I can have a quick look. Okay, Amal.
Hi, Amal. So it, it will indeed stay like that because now basically the Verdi REST API is running. But in order to get this to work, maybe I can uh, quickly help you out again in the breakout room. So let's move back into the breakout room and then I can help you set this up.
All right, so hopefully most people have come back from the coffee break if they have taken one. Um, since some people have already indicated on the Slack and also in the Zoom chat here that they had a bit of issues in um, setting up the NCROC and everything to use the REST API and then explore their database, I just want to quickly show this again because I think at this point, most people or a lot of people are already at the stage in the tutorial. So I will simply quickly share my screen and go over these commands um, so everyone can understand better how to actually execute this. So this is in 1.6.1.5 of the first part of the tutorial. And first, as it says here, you have to start the REST API. So the Ferdy REST API simply serves the data in your database so other um, instances can do get commands, so you can get information from your database once this REST API is active. Second, because we're working on a remote resource, so we're using this Jupyter Jupyter Hub cluster on Amazon Web Services, we, we have to somehow expose this um, local URL to a public one. And so in order to do this, we have used this tool called ngrok. And so when this REST API is running, you simply open a second terminal. Again, you can just do this by going to the main Jupyter Hub page and clicking on terminal. And so while your REST API is running, you will also then open this, this NCROC, which will basically connect your local host where the um, REST API is serving the data to this public URL here. And so this public URL needs to be provided, of course, to the Materials Cloud Explore section, because this is actually the interface by which you can then um, explore your, your database. So then in turn here, it has a link to the Materials Cloud Explore section. So you simply click on that. You plug in this link. But you still have to add, and this is important, forward slash API forward slash version 4, v4. And if you do that, then you'll be able to connect to your database. And then this looks something a little, well, let me just do it like this. There we go, like this. And then on the left, you can look for processes. I haven't run that much here, but there isn't that much data available. Um, but so then you can, you can start exploring your, your, your provenance of, of your database. So what's actually happening here is that, and you can also see this if you look at um, REST API here. So as I am going to explore certain parts of this database and I click on it, this Materials Clouds uh, Explore section API simply asks for information from your database, which is now exposed via NGROC, right? So the database never leaves your system. It's just still on, on the remote server that you're using now, but it simply, uh, the materials cloud simply retrieves this data via get commands um, and then can show it to you in this materials cloud explorer section and then if you have a certain calculation you can look at inputs of your calculation files you can look at the output files etc okay so hopefully for everyone who's reached this point of the tutorial you've now been able to set this up if not again ask questions you can either just answer in the slack or go into a breakout room so we can go through the steps in case you um, have difficulties in setting this up
so yeah, I mean, for, starting with the second part, but well, you can already start. Maybe um, Flaviano can already give a brief overview of what you'll be doing in the second section of the tutorial. So if you've completed the first one, great, then you can already get started there. Um, if not, no worries, of course, you can still continue on the first part of the tutorial and then continue later. So maybe Flaviano, I, I, I can give you the word and you can give a little overview of what they were doing in the parts on uh, managing your data and querying. I'm not sure if you're already talking, Flaviano, but you're still muted. Thank you, Marnik. So I was saying that uh, what we have learned in the first part of the hands-on was we learned how to import the structures, for example, to the ADA databases, how to set up the codes, how to set up the calculation and running it. And then we did some analysis of our results and so on. But the more we learned how to run calculations through workflows that make takes a very complex uh, calculation and simplify and automatize the process. And now imagine that we have done this thousand, ten thousand of times. And all this bit of information, I store these nodes in the AIDA database. So structures, code, everything are, are nodes and everybody, everything is in the same box. Yeah? We have a flat organization of those nodes. So what we want to do in the second part of the hands-on is to create some uh, organization, maybe to group together some nodes, maybe because they share some common features and properties together. So we want to organize this data, creating groups. And also we want to search for data. You, know, you might want to query to, to find specific groups. Let's say we want to find all structures that are result of a relaxation calculation. Uh, not in instruct that you input, but the one that are result of from calculations. So these also you're gonna learn a little bit in the second part of the tutorial. So I will let you to it. Please go to the second chapter of the, of the hands-on and go reading slowly, bit by bit. It's important that we pay attention to every bit of information because there are new concepts that you need some time to absorb. And also, yeah, let us know when you have any questions. So please do it slowly. For those that have already finished the first part, those that are still working on it, don't worry, please continue working the session one. And then when you are done, you can start session number two. And we'll be here to, to help you with any questions. And speaking of doing things slowly, um, this first import command, as I've already mentioned before, can take a bit of time. So if you haven't done it already during the coffee break, then maybe just start it now and then um, right, right. have a little extra coffee break or read to some other sectional material already because it can take a, a few minutes. It's, it's mainly because this is all um, run on this Jupyter Hub cluster on Amazon Web Services. And it seems that somehow this is, this could take quite a bit of time there. So um, so give so it a go and, and let us know. What Marek means is exactly this command over here. The first command of chapter two, please do it as soon as possible. It takes some time. It takes about 10 minutes or so.
All right, so there's about 45 minutes left for the hands-on, but it seems that many people have already finished all the material, which is it's good to hear. I, and here I was worried that we might not have enough time to finish everything. Um, but before everyone's done and already leaves the, the, the Zoom meeting, I would like to still share, um, wait, there we go, um, some details on, on how you can still connect with us after the tutorial. Of course, if you're still working on the tutorial material, um, we'll still be online until 12.30 in the Zoom meeting. And in the afternoon, if you still have questions, don't hesitate to ask on the Slack channel. If you um, are, are still working on material later, uh, just a quick reminder that um, the Jupyter Hub clusters will be shut down tomorrow at uh, noon Central Eastern European time, um, summer time, CEST. So make sure that you remove any data that you're interested in uh, before them. And then afterwards, you can always stay in touch via the AIDA mailing list. Um, or if you have certain issues that you'd like to raise, with go, you can always go um, to the GitHub issue space. I have to update this link here. And uh, of course, this is only um, a small introduction to AIDA and some of its features. Uh, in the summer, from July 5th until 9th, we're organizing a longer tutorial for AIDA. So if you're interested in learning more, you can register there. I'll put all of these links uh, in, in the Slack channel so you can find them easily. So um, other than that, you can also still continue working on this. Um, wait, I have to share the right screen here. On this extra appendix section that we have here, um, this is basically a, a more basic version of a tutorial, which without talking about anything related to quantum espresso, tries to explain constants as provenance and everything, and the different types of nodes in more detail. So you can still work through that if you're interested. So with that, I would like to already thank everyone for joining. Um, if you have any more questions, of course, don't hesitate to ask in the Zoom chat, raise a hand or, or contact us in the Slack channel. As I've already said previously, you can always still contact us this afternoon or whatever the time may be in the time zone you're in. And we'll be happy to still answer questions. Thank you very much, Marnik. Yes, I don't see questions on uh, on the YouTube stream here, but I see that I think uh, you answered already all the questions on Zoak and Zoom. It's... Yeah, I think most of these were related to the tutorial material, so we've answered there. So yeah, yeah. And again, I mean, we'll still be here. The is it over? I just already, because I saw people were leaving because they were finished with the material. I always want to take a few notes, but we will be here for at least another 45 minutes to help you out. Uh, also in Zoom breakout rooms, if you want. And again, you know, continue working the material. You still have time until tomorrow and the Slack will still be open even afterwards, as long as, as you know, I'll be monitoring this Slack channel. I'm part of the, I have it part of my Zoom uh, Slack workspace. So, you know, ask questions there. We'd be happy to answer. Yes. So keep on working on the tutorial at your own pace. Okay. Do, do you want us to, to put the screen server here or you want to stay connected? Uh, is, uh, just, just let us know. Yeah, like, like I said, I'll, be, I'll, I'll stay connected until, of course, 12.30, okay. until the hands-on is finished. Um, I just want to already make some notes because people were, were starting to leave. So. Okay, so we leave the, the, the Zoom like uh, as is now. And, uh, yes. If uh, someone wants to ask you even in Slack or here in chat or raise hand, uh, uh, of course you are available for answering, right? Yes, of course. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Marnik. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. And also to all the tutors, of course. Yeah. Marnik, do you want to mention the the main AIDA tutorial that are going to happen in July? So, so I, I thought I did, <laughs> um, but maybe it was very quick, but I'll put all of this information again um, in the Slack channel. So, you know, it's also at the end. So if you're at the end of the tutorial, what's next? There's a link straight to the registration form. So 
people can be able to find quite easily. Um, this will be a five day tutorial where we explain more because of course, there's quite a bit more to learn from AIDA that we can not all fit into uh, one, one morning. So definitely uh, encourage everyone, all these quantum espresso experts now to, to join for this larger tutorial as well. Uh, I saw, yes, here there's a question. Yes, we will uh, uh, meet, uh, come back at uh, 2 30 chess time for the, um, for the special guest lecture from uh, Nicolas Spalding. So, yes, in case uh, uh, you, yeah, yeah that, that is uh, the, the, next, uh, the next appointment. And I see that uh, maybe Tone raised the hand. Maybe, I don't know if. if no, huh. I, I just uh, made a reaction of applause. Huh. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so this is kind of confusing indeed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, because yesterday we used the, the raised hand option to, to, to have feedback. So when uh, they finished the exercises, I, we asked them to raise the hand to let us know at which point they were. So. So maybe this uh, this created a bit of confusion.
to answer Christian's question, um, if you have run the, the command that actually creates this PDF, you can then go to a file manager. So on the main Jupyter Hub um, page, you can open a file manager. And there you can then navigate to where this demo query PDF file is and simply open it there. Um, I have noticed that sometimes if you try to open it directly, it, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't allow you to, to interact with it. In that case, you can just select it on the left and then click on download a bit about that. So then you can just start downloading it to your, your, your workstation and that way open the file. Let me know if this works for you.
to ex ex expand a bit on, on uh, Alfonso's question. Um, so if you delete, delete a node from a database, AIDA will automatically delete certain nodes depending on the connections of these nodes in the database. Um, basically, for example, if you um, delete uh, a certain calculation, um, it, it will might it will probably if, or for example also delete certain outputs that are used in this calculation right so be careful with deleting nodes because you won't just be deleting that single node you'll also be deleting other connections throughout the database to make sure that this database stays consistent i can actually wait maybe forward you to the documentation that explains how this exactly works just a second yes, i'm about to copy the link uh, if you ah, great thanks francisco so and you can also um, change the rules of how AIDA does this, right? Provenance consistency, exactly. So there you can see nice little charts that explain better how AIDA actually deletes nodes from the database.
All right, we're getting close to um, 12.30, the official end of uh, this hands-on session. For those that are still working, um, of course, again, if you still have any questions after we end the Zoom meeting, um, don't hesitate to ask on the Slack. We'll still be monitoring this until this weekend, for sure. Um, and of course, I, I would be remiss in forgetting to mention that at 2.30, there is still a special guest lecture. Um, so of course, everyone still attend that. And I, maybe Ivan still has some final words you would like to uh, to say now? Yeah, I was just about to remember all of all of them uh, about the special lecture. So yes, yeah, okay. that, that, that was, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes so. at 2.30 we have uh, Nicola Spaldin, and so we meet again uh, here on Zoom. Uh, I think that uh, Massimo can now, when we close now, we can put the screen server. And uh, of course, uh, the Slack channel is, uh, is available for questions as usual. So exactly. thank you very much uh, again, uh, Marnik and all of the uh, all tutors for this uh, Aida and so on and lecture. So thanks again for the invitation. Um, we hope uh, everyone was able to learn quite a lot. And of course, we thank also all the participants for their uh, participation to the group. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you.